Uh, hi everyone, my name is uh, Tejasvi. Some of you may know me as TJ. Uh, and that's a change that happened many years ago because enough people had butchered my name, which is actually a, a very unusual name. So I have uh, made peace with uh, being addressed as, uh, as TJ. Um, I have taken the you know, liberty of uh, changing the uh, title of the presentation. I think the title of the event was Extending the Runway, but I'm pretty sure all of you would agree with me that uh, we have had enough of extensions and we've had enough of the word extend or derivatives for our entire lifetime. So I'll uh, save all of us the pain and I've decided to call it uh, live to fight another day. Okay. So when I was, uh, while I was preparing for the session, I uh, began thinking about some of the stories that, uh, you know, that uh, truly uh, exemplify this theme. And, uh, and, you know, I'm a firm believer that stories are very powerful and it's a very powerful way of communicating a message. Uh, and the story that uh, many stories came to my mind, uh, as you can imagine, but the one that really stood out was this uh, test match. It's a little bit of a tan tangential example, but uh, this I'm pretty sure many of us remember this uh, epic test series between India and Australia that was played uh, roughly 20 years ago in 2001. Uh, and uh, this was the second test match of, uh, of the series. Uh, and uh, the first one India had lost to Australia. India had actually gotten decimated and the beginning of the second test was not uh, not uh, any better. Uh, and this was, uh, you know, day four when Dravid, I think Dravid was playing around hundreds and Lakshman had just come in, uh, or rather Lakshman was playing around hundreds and Dravid had just come into bat. And on the fourth day when the Australian, uh, uh, Australian pace attack was literally and figuratively spewing fire these two gentlemen stood uh, their ground against uh, against the Australian bowling attack for the entire day, added 270 odd runs. Uh, and the fifth day, you know, uh, you know, we uh, Australia came into bat and we won the test test the test match, and then eventually we won the third test match in Chennai as well, and the rest of the history. Uh, and the reason I think uh, you know this is uh, this is important is because a the circumstances or the situation that these two gentlemen found themselves in is quite uh, representative of the times that we are living in today. Uh, we, you know, at times we might have this sinking feeling that uh, we are faced with some uh, insurmountable problems, uh, which was the case in, you know, in, in, for, for this match as well. Uh, but there's always a way out. And, uh, uh, you know, if you put up a spirited fight, if you put up a concerted effort, uh, you, the, the human spirit eventually uh, comes out on top. So that is one, actually that is the most important takeaway of this presentation, which I've given, given you on slide two. Uh, so if there's, uh, I'd love for all, you know, uh, folks who are interested in cricket to reflect on this test series, or this test match in particular, and think about uh, what we can learn uh, from, uh, from these innings. So I think before we jump into the slides and the way I structured the slides is, uh, uh, you know, there'll be uh, many micro examples of what we have seen other portfolio companies and other companies that we know well of do some of the best practices. And remember, we are just uh, communicators or we are carriers of uh, good insights and good information. Uh, so, you know, at Sequoia in India, we have the vantage point of 150 odd companies or more. And uh, and we have been able to sort of find some best practices, identify uh, some uh, effective solutions to combating uh, the slowdown or the economic hardship that uh, many of the businesses today are going through. Uh, and then there'll be some sort of macro themes that uh, that may help you overarching themes that may help you think through uh, uh, th think through your individual or specific uh, you know situation because obviously different various businesses are different and uh, what may apply or what may be effective in one business may not be uh, may not uh, be so effective in the other and hence it is important to abstract out some uh, high level or overarching principles that one could apply uh, in in this combat against uh, against covid uh, so, but before we jump into the meat, meat of the deck, uh, let's actually uh, sort of take a step back and I think it will put things into perspective and look at the evolution of the Indian startup ecosystem as a whole. Uh, we literally kind of got, got started around 2009, although some might argue that, you know, just dial and make my trip uh, were companies that were founded before 2009, which is, I think, fair. But 2009, when Flipkart received that first million dollars from Axel, at least in my mind, was a true beginning of the Indian Startup ecosystem. Uh, so that was the sort of the first, uh, and then the first, the next, you know, the, the first five years of our evolution were more around 
finding a product market fit. And when I say, you know, product market fit, fit I'm not referring to a specific product, but I'm referring to the proposition of technology to a market and economy like India. Does technolo technology work? I mean, we had those kind of existentialist questions back then. Is technology valuable? Uh, will in, does India have uh, enough resources and maturity to leverage technology? Uh, those are some of the questions. I think uh, first five years uh, kind of answered those questions. And by 2014, we had very well proved to the world that technology is uh, going to be a, going to play a very important role in the in the evolution of India as an economy, in the, in the evolution of India as a market, and uh, consumption behavior in India. And then uh, 2014 to 19 is what uh, I call the run forest run phase, which is when we were, all of us were running very hard, catalyzed by Reliance Geo, that has truly uh, you know, democratized access to technology. Uh, and, uh, and that kind of revolution is still underway, uh, but, uh, but we already have you know, 400 to 450 million uh, smartphone users in the country, 100 million online shoppers uh, in the country, 120 million digital payment users in the country, which is no mean feat for a ecosystem that is only 10 years old. And we should all feel very proud of what we have collectively been able to achieve in the last 10 years. And I think, uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, in fact, last year, uh, you know, I was musing about, uh, you know, this theme of evolution of startup ecosystems. And, and I felt that uh, time it was already high time before we start thinking about the third phase, which is what I call show me the money, show me the money phase. Uh, which will involve uh, economic convergence of businesses. Businesses are losing a lot of money. That is not a surprise to anyone who's attending this uh, webinar today. And uh, we truly have to think about sustainability. We have to think about uh, uh, profitability of, uh, of, of these businesses. So I think that uh, transition was very well underway and COVID has obviously precipitated, precipitated that transition and has uh, brought this issue of sustainability front and center. To, uh, to public attention as far as the startup ecosystem is control, concerned. And then the last phase, which we'll you know, talk about later in the, in the presentation is the cruise control mode. When companies start going public, wealth creation starts happening uh, and uh, you have a nice uh, and healthy ecosystem uh, which has profits, uh, which, has, which has created wealth, which has created employment, which has truly created value for, for, for our country. So we are in, you know, phase phase three right now, and uh, and now one might ask, hey, how do you know that this transition was already happening? And I, you know, I collated some stats. Uh, these are not public data, but this is at least best, uh, you know, as best to my understanding as possible. As I started ecosystem in 2019, we burned about uh, nine to ten billion dollars, uh, and uh, just for perspective, the top 50 companies uh, listed in pub Indian public market generate about 45 to 50 billion dollars of PAT. So just to put things in perspective, 10 billion dollars of burn every year, and I think that number is probably more than 10, but conservatively, 10 billion dollars of burn per year is a big number. Uh, and uh, so far, you know, the startup ecosystem has raised north of uh, 50 billion dollars. And my personal estimates suggest that even prior to COVID, we as an ecosystem, we had uh, you know a collective runway of two years. Now, these are not very encouraging numbers, but this put in perspective or put in the context of the growth rates that we are seeing in the country. I think uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say justifies it, but makes it more uh, kind of relatable or understandable. Uh, and then uh, you know, obviously, all of us have heard about the gloom and doom and the damage that COVID has done to our economy. Our economy is most likely going to shrink for the first time, I think, in 30, 40 years, maybe longer. Uh, several hundred, you know, several tens of millions of People have been pushed into unemployment. Uh, you know, the, there's been reverse migration. The curve is not flattened, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so the point is, even if COVID had not, not happened, I think the numbers on the left-hand side of the chart were pretty alarming. And there were already murmurs and there were already uh, kind of uh, conversations and dialogues around sustainability of the ecosystem and the need to course correct. Uh, so we should see COVID as a messenger uh, or a divine messenger, rather, not uh, not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, it is of course a crisis and it is a, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a grave crisis, but uh, this, uh, at least the correction, the course correction was inevitable as far as the startup ecosystem is concerned. Now, this is, you know, I don't want to paint a gloomy and gloom and doom picture. So this is where all the bad news ends. Uh, and we still have another 40, 50 minutes in the presentation. Now, the good news is that this, such crises, uh, 
have happened in the past and many times in the past the economic cycle is literally a pendulum it uh, moves uh, you know far far enough in in the direction of a bull cycle and then there's a correction and then it moves moves uh, you know far in in the direction of a bear cycle and the the e economy you know uh, largely keeps oscillating between these two cycles the good news is that the bear cycles uh, on an average historically have the bull cycles on historically have lasted longer than bear cycles uh, and then there are certain commonalities between bull cycles and bear, bear cycles and i'm sure everyone on the call on the webinar today is uh, is aware of that you know stocks are quite expensive uh, and uh, you know the pe multiples or the trading multiples uh, you know sh shoot to the shoot to the roof so those are some of the characteristics of of uh, of a bull cycle uh, and similar bull cycles have happened you know up until 1999 then again up until 2005 2006 so there's nothing new about this uh, about as far as the economic cycle is concerned of course we are facing probably the largest epidemic uh, probably the largest human humanitarian crisis that the world has seen in the last maybe 70 80 years uh, but i'm not gonna, i'm not an expert so i'm not going to comment on that but as far as the economic cycle is concerned this is uh, this has happened in the past and therefore there are some best practices and therefore there are some learnings and takeaways which i want to share with you guys today over the next 30 40 minutes um you know uh, i think metaphorically we are as ecosystem we are a ship and uh, today we find ourselves in the eye of a storm uh, and then you know the obvious uh, thing to do is to first recalibrate the direction because clearly you know we are headed probably in not the the best direction possible so we recalibrate the compass which is step 1 then you steer the ship which is probably the harder part and then you go full steam ahead uh, once uh, once you have steered the ship so this is going to be the sort of the tracker for the rest of the slides so everything begins with the everything begins with a plan uh and uh, you know as as startup founders and uh, you know executives and you know founding members uh, we have to you know we have to not let inertia of good times uh cloud our judgment this is this crisis is real and uh, we have to act very swiftly so first you know recognize the situation that that we are in recognize the uh, the world that is changing around it and then start planning for for the new normal as uh, you know as they call it uh, and sometimes you might feel that you know it is over reaction and you know it is okay to let things be for the next couple of months i think over reaction is totally fine especially if you are facing a crisis uh, uh, a economic crisis like this over reaction is uh, totally par for the course and then you know while while the journey of a founder is solitary is very lonely uh, i'm sure all of you are blessed with a very good team like your top lieutenants uh, at at your companies and i think the need of the hour is to get rally the forces behind you and it starts from the top so uh, one thing that we have seen uh, most of our companies that have so far fared well in weathering this crisis is to uh, you know gather a team of top lieutenants and then there is a uh and they they will be you know they will be individual and collective inertia and there will be some resistance to change because you know the at least the time uh the today's time uh, warrants a very in some cases very dramatic changes also so as founder i think the onus is on you guys to uh do the convincing persuade your team and influence them to uh, you know adapt and be prepared for uh some dramatic changes in some cases uh so once 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 that is done then you go back to the whiteboard and basically rethink your business uh and uh, you know while you're rethinking your business uh, one thing that i've seen you know work very well for companies is to just shed all uh shed all dogma there is no da suspend all judgments shed all dogma and literally you know rethink the business from first principles there are no sacred assumptions in the business anymore uh everything is possible Uh, so literally bottom up start thinking about the business uh, without uh, without any any baggage and what you'll be surprised by is the you know sometimes some of the assumptions or some of the things that you may want to change may seem over ambitious and over audacious uh, but one thing that we have seen uh, the best of founders and the best of companies do is to act with a lot of resilience in hard times and uh, you know we ourselves as board members have been surprised by the resilience of startups and founders tell us that they are also surprised by the resilience of their business the resilience of their of their people and it's a little bit of uh, you know the survival instincts once you have your back against the wall then all the good ideas start flowing out uh, and you really push yourself organizationally and and individually uh, to uh, to do things that uh, you know do things that one could not have imagined earlier 
and then finally this uh, you know this is also a time when you need to over communicate with your board with other stakeholders uh with uh, with your employees uh and make sure that everyone is uh, have fully bought in you know bought into the plan and uh, you know this might uh, it might it might feel like it takes a lot of time and uh, you can take a decision unilaterally but our experience has been that in hard times you need buy in and you need uh, the full support of your team more than ever because you know you're literally sort of operating on the edges and uh, uh, and the margin for error is low and hence you want full commitment a full body commitment from from your team and then you know if if you want to kind of uh, calibrate whether your plan is good or not or do a sanity check this is a uh, kind of a uh, you know thumb rule that uh, that we have come up with uh, the, your runway goal should be a maximum of either two times or what you had pre covid or three years and the number three years is important because most of the best cycles that we've seen last typically between one to three years so you know plan for the worst and hope for the best now we come to the second part of the process which i think is probably the trickiest uh, and uh, and of course uh, super important uh and this is where you know i'll share the bulk of the learnings that we have seen from across portfolio companies now i want to i want you guys to spend maybe you know 30 seconds looking at this slide this is a very important slide uh we call it the pyramid of providence you can call it whatever you like pyramid of prudence or whatever but this is basically top to down this tells you the uh you know it has been organized in the decreasing order of dispensability meaning what's at the top is most dispensable what's at the bottom which is people uh is least dispensable and on the right hand side of the slide like i said these are some of the overarching principles that might resonate resonate with you or might uh, uh you know help you make uh, tough decisions because of course not uh, not every idea is applicable or relevant to to all businesses so we'll start with cash is king uh this is very important because while you this is the time when cash the the metric cash in the in the bank trumps all other metrics i mean this is the only metric that matters frankly uh and uh, you have to make sure as founders and as cfos if there are some cfos on the call uh that all the you know pnl efficiency all the goodness from pnl translates into cash because that's what uh, you know really matters and it starts with uh, you know restructuring debt some of you may have that some of you may not uh and we've seen many companies many cfos you know go back to uh the creditors uh, ask for uh you know concessions ask for moratorium ask for relief on payment schedule ask for even in some cases refinance the loan uh and you'll be surprised by how you know open minded all these people the entire ecosystem that is working to make you guys successful less because uh their success is contingent on your success and the last thing any of these you know ecosystem vendors or partners want is to see a business go under because then they lose the business permanently and they are happy to make the many of them are open minded if not happy to make the short term sacrifices uh for the long term good second i think this should be an obvious one you know freeze all capital investments uh the, you know unless super necessary i think it is it is almost a sin to making uh to be making capital expenditures right now so just freeze it uh third you know uh, working capital we have already touched upon this uh, talk to your suppliers uh you know ask for more grace period restructure payment schedules and all of this is possible and we've seen you know uh, basically cfos were more persistent cfos were more detail oriented uh, uh be really surprised by surprise us with uh, what they've been able to achieve uh, you know through some of these initiatives and then finally this is most important i think uh, appoint you could appoint someone uh, and you could call him cash to steward or whatever you you want whatever you like but basically this is the person who knows the almost like an hourly cash flow and knows the cash position almost on an hourly basis and uh, it requires a lot of detail planning so pick someone who's you know more analytical more detail oriented and basically chart out the cash flows the expected cash flows on a maybe day to day or week to week basis based based on uh, the cash flow characteristics of your business and uh, you know and make sure that your top lieutenants that were identified in step 1 are all aware of of the cash cash uh, position in the company and also the cash cash flow projections for the next month or next quarter hey oh, tj sorry there's a question from akhilesh can you explain the rationale behind the runway and why it should be 3 years once more so like i said uh this is a time when you know obviously you extend the runway question is how long uh and uh, uh, the the way we thought about 
you know, the three year number is that we have seen many of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, bear cycles last three years, or uh, in anywhere between one to three years. So you prepare for the, and there's, by the way, there's no guarantee. This is not to say that we know that it is going to last three years or longer or shorter. But I think uh, it's prudent to prepare for the worst, which in this case, uh, you know, three year uh, is, is a good enough number. By the way, I forgot, uh, I forgot to mention, but if you have any questions, please uh, type it out in the Q&A tab. There's a Q&A tab in the bottom bar to so type out your questions and uh, we can keep it interactive. We can, uh, you know, I can address questions uh, uh, through the presentation and not necessarily wait till the end of the presentation. The second principle is around, uh, you know, creating new uh, monetization or revenue avenues, revenue opportunities. And we call it new, every new penny found today is worth a pound because it matters so much to your business. Uh, and the rationale here being that, uh, you know, it's easier, at least we have seen it's easier to ramp up your revenues by 10% than to co cut your costs by 10% because cost uh, cutting is very painful and it disrupts business and it creates a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of heartburn, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but if your team is, you know, creative and you can do some experimentations, you can be more open-minded, then you can truly unlock some, uh, even if it is opportunistic uh, uh, revenue, uh, revenue models or revenue avenues, I think it is totally, totally worth it. So as founders, I think uh, the need of the R is uh, to be open-minded, no ideas are dumb, uh, and really indulge your team. I mean, some of the best ideas initially sounded very dumb. And uh, build on, build on to, build on, uh, on ideas and really encourage your team to constantly look out for new monetization opportunities. Uh, and I think there's a long-term benefit. The short-term benefit is that you get more cash, but the long-term benefit uh, is uh, that it makes a business more anti-fragile. Uh, at least, you know, I personally have this theory that if you, as a business, if you have only one revenue model or only one re revenue uh, stream, then you are very vulnerable. Jeff Bezos says your margin is my opportunity, right? So, uh, so you know, the next disruptor can come and disrupt that one uh, revenue uh, stream. But if you have multiple, then it makes the business more robust. It makes the business more anti-fragile. And then, you know, on the right hand side, we have some examples of what we've seen. Moglix is, is one of our companies in the B2B space. Uh, they, they are an MRO platform, but then they identified this, uh, you know, uh, opportunity uh, in the, uh, uh, in the PPNE space, the, you know, the protective gear that you need for the frontier uh, medical workers. And they started, you know, many of their clients wanted PPNE supply. So they started, uh, you know, selling and distributing PPNE today, PPNE is like 40% of, of their revenue and company is actually in May company actually grew over last May. So, which is kind of bucking the trend, which is most companies have degrown over last year. Uh, similarly, you know, uh, we have seen cult how, uh, uh, you know, they have uh, kind of switched their engagement model or kind of the business model with so much agi agility. It is, it is quite impressive. They've already racked up millions of DAOs on their, uh, on their digital health platform. So I think the, and you know, some of these ideas may not be relevant to your business, uh, but the point is if there are, you know, creative ideas in your team uh, and it may, they may sound tactical, they may sound opportunistic, but as long as you can make that extra buck, I think mean, it is super valuable. One more question from Sanket. He wants to know how can the strategies you're outlining be implemented in a startups that's very newly launched? I think, uh, Again, uh, these are, it's hard to answer the question because I don't know the specifics of, uh, of these startups. I'd say for, for young startups, one thing that you can definitely do is to accelerate your monetization plans. And uh, later in the slides, we'll talk about demand elasticity and, uh, you know, the sort of the segregation between good and bad customers. Uh, but at least, you know, up until uh, before COVID, we'd, uh, we'd see many startups, young startups defer monetization plans. I think this is the time to accelerate Excellent monetization plans. Uh, but Sanket, happy to, you know, happy to uh, speak with you offline. And if uh, I don't know the details of your business, but happy to, you know, brainstorm and jam with you uh, if that helps. Uh, one more question, if you can take, uh, Nakul is asking, can you share what car they coded? Yeah, it's very interesting. And th thanks for asking that question. So car deco has, uh, uh, very large uh, customer care or call center. And these call center folks basically, uh, you know, help people buy cars. Uh, so, uh, you know, they would uh, kind of help people pick cars and then make sure that the 
transaction is consummated so they would uh, they would liaison between the dealers and the customers make sure the customer get the best price and so on and so forth now, obviously car sales in the last couple of months or last quarter now has been very severely hit so now you have say hundreds of call center folks uh, they have nothing to do because no one is buying cars so what amit at uh, car deco did was he repurposed this entire team because these guys can i mean these are basically sales people so they can sell stuff and they repurposed it for more counter cyclical uh, businesses so say education or insurance like things that are still selling digital goods that are still selling they, and then they you know uh, started offering this call center service and again it's super ca- tactical right it's got nothing to do with car deco score business but uh, they started offering this call center service to other clients that uh, needed uh, that needed this workforce and they monetized it so it is tactical but you know if it gives you the extra buck why not the third principle is around doing more with less so getting ma- more bang for the buck uh, and really sort of stretching uh, the boundaries or pushing the boundaries on efficiencies on productivity and on on roi so here what we have seen is uh, the best of the cfos and founders do is to literally go through all your contracts all your you know supply side contracts just go through them surgically go through them identify uh, contracts which are large and meaningful where a renegotiation with the supplier or any renegotiation of terms can be meaningful to the overall cost saving uh, goals of the company uh, and we have seen companies you know uh, one of our companies rebel foods that runs uh, india's largest uh, cloud kitchen network they went back to your they, they, and they have you know these 300 or or more cloud kitchens so these are dark stores located in like 30 odd cities they went to all their landlords and said hey we can't you know pay you the same rent because uh, you know our business has been hit uh, and uh, and you'll be shocked i mean they they were able to on an average they were able to negotiate between 15 to 25% savings and the landlords are okay doing that because like i said they don't want to kill their golden goose right like they would much rather have the company have this company weather this crisis survive and thrive uh then be adamant on getting the same uh, uh the same rent knowing fully well that their uh, the infrastructure is not being utilized as much as it was pre covid uh then you have seen some companies uh, you know be very smart with their cloud spends so i think uh, many of the ctos uh, prefer diversification of cloud vendors which is smart uh, because you don't want to put all your eggs in the same basket but then covid has kind of forced them or given them this idea of consolidating all the cloud spend and going to say aws or gcp or whoever and saying hey i'm going to give you 100% of my cloud spend give me a preferential price uh, and many of these guys are open minded and i'm sure all of many of us have read uh, you know uh, articles and news around how large software vendors are uh, you know providing payment concessions pay, providing discounts uh, to uh, to their clients so you don't get you know what you don't ask for so basically you know just this be just go and ask be more forthright in asking for discount and payment concessions and so on similarly one of the companies they went back to so they had some uh, they had uh, partnerships with airtel and i think uh, one of the other telcos for uh, messaging so you know they would send messages to their clients they went to airtel and said hey i'm going to consolidate all of uh, my messaging or telco spend with you uh, but uh, you give me a third 20% uh, discount on uh, uh, so i'll give you more volume but give me 20% uh, discount on 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 a per unit basis and then you know interestingly enough this company has locked this this price which is the covid price which is obviously at a discount to normal for the next 3 years so they'll be able to uh, harness the benefit of this pricing even beyond beyond covid so i think the 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 best practice here is to literally sit with your cfo go line item by line item go contract by contract identify contracts that are meaningful and uh, and uh, you know reach out to your supply for for more favorable terms okay if we can pause for a couple of questions um sure. sitarth wants to know how can adding an alternative revenue model be justified in a crisis when there is additional cost involved in order to implement the model itself that's a good question uh, i think the the thumb rule here is i'm not uh, i'm not suggesting you know you go all out and like you know create 500 uh, revenue models i think uh, the 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 sort of the overarching principle is you only expand revenue models that are profitable and like and that's why you know i kept i keep harping on making a buck uh, so in case of car deco for example they they're making like 20% profit on on this new monetization model uh, so I, i would not suggest i would not advise you guys to 
uh, you know, extend a new revenue model that is not profitable, that is not advisable at all. In fact, that is counterproductive. Why would you lose money on on a on a business or uh, on a you know on a revenue stream that is not good to your to your business? Uh, so do it as long as you make you can make money. Uh, and one more question from Nidhi: uh, This opportunistic revenue options are not your revenue model. Doesn't this defocus the startup? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, Nidhi, and uh, we'll we'll talk about it later in the slides. Uh, it is, uh, and therefore, you know, it's it's up to your judgment. Uh, in so, see, there basically there are two types of companies today, right? One companies where demand has been so severely hit, right, uh, that uh, your you know workforce or your employees employees are not operating at full capacity, not operating, are not gainfully employed, like they don't have much to a lot to do. Uh, car car deco being a case in point. So for those businesses, I think the, the the fundamental principle here is to repurpose the existing assets, uh, people in this case, for monetize, for creating new revenue streams. So I'm not advising, I'm not suggesting that uh, you know uh, you distract your workforce away from your core business and create something that that can make you a, a tiny buck. What I'm suggesting is that if you have 20% of your workforce that is not gainfully occupied, then can you create some monetization levers on top of that? Um, uh, okay, so let's keep moving. Uh, next is infrastructure consolidation. Uh, so again, do more with less. Uh, in case in case of Rebel Foods, we had you know we have 320 odd kitchens, but we have hibernated 30% or so of uh, of our kitchens, uh, and we are trying to service the same pin codes or the same uh, catchment area with fewer kitchens, which is possible today because you know traffic's traffic uh, uh, density etc has subsided in most large cities uh, and uh, and consumers probably become a bit more tolerant to slight slight delays in in deliveries uh, and then finally finally you know treat people as assets people build businesses and that's why you know in this pyramid of providence uh, you know we have argued that the least dispensable resource that you have is people uh, and you know what we have seen some companies do is uh, amp up the employee pro productivity through multiple things. Uh, one is uh, you know there are many cost. I'm sure like many startups had have uh, cost efficiencies or cost cutting initiatives that were kind of put on the back burner given the focus was on growth pre-COVID. Now this is the opportune time to bring all those uh, uh, projects, build, build, bring all those ideas to the fore, and reassign folks to those ideas. So you can literally say okay. Uh, I'm just, you know, hypothetically making it up. Uh, but let's say you had 20 people in sales and BD, uh, and you say, okay, we're going to make do with 10 or 12, and the remaining eight people are going to focus on sales efficiency projects or cost efficiency projects, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, and then uh, and then finally, you know, rethink the reward system. Uh, in today's, you know, in today's uh, circumstances, uh, I think you know a very counterintuitive idea. Is to disproportionately reward your top 15% employees. What that does psychologically on the employees is that now, given the uncertainty of times, everyone wants to do their best. Everyone wants to contribute uh, to the company, and then people, uh, the desire to be rewarded, the desire to feature in the top 15% uh, employees is far more now than it was say six months ago. And therefore, if you disproportionately reward the top 15% or whatever that number is, top 20% people, it kind of uh, gets more out of people and it uh, forces a sense of urgency it forces a sense of responsibility and increases overall productivity if there are no more questions uh, there are a couple the... but maybe just finish the section and then i'll get okay. to it uh, and then the last principle is around no sacred cows this uh, uh, kind of alludes to what i said earlier that there are no all bets are off in today's world there are no sacred assumptions uh, so you have to, this is the time when we rethink everything. Uh, so it starts with, uh, you know, marketing. This is probably, uh, you know, the, this is probably the most uh, kind of discretionary spend that a startup has, marketing, discounting, promotion, anything which is related to demand generation. And what we have found here over the last couple of months is actually mind boggling. Uh, we were quite uh, uh, concerned about demand elasticity. And there was, and you know, founders practically, founders uh, honestly didn't know how elastic is demand in their category. Uh, and there was this uh, risk or concern that demand might just evaporate should you discontinue discounting and promotions. 
And we have found, uh, what we have found is evidence on the contrary. In fact, there is, uh, the demand elasticity is not very high in many, in most categories, I would argue. In one of our companies, they, you know, they're discounting or, uh, I'm not going to name this company, but say, their discounting or marketing cost was 20% of overall revenues. They turned it off uh, overnight, made it zero. And, uh, you know, the demand fell by 40%, but they still had 60% demand. So I think this is the time that will separate the good customer from a bad customer. You will truly know who your good customers are and uh, who are more opportunistic, deal hunting, hunting customers. And do it, you know, dispassionately. Like, um, just turn it off. Just turn off discounting, marketing, uh, and uh, and see you know and, and sort of observe the demand elasticity in your in your business and embed it into your uh, into your cash projections going forward. Uh, second is uh, uh, there are many discretionary spend uh, embedded in your corporate overheads. Corporate overheads is a little bit of a black box because investors and board are maniacally focused on unit economics and corporate overhead is seen as more like a discretionary fixed cost. Uh, and what we, you know, in some of the companies where we went deeper, we realized that many of these costs were built for two, three X higher scale or assume anticipating a two, three X growth. So you build the cost structure in advance and much of this cost was very discretionary in nature. You have consulting firms, you have, you know, some contracted employees, uh, you have, uh, you know, bunch of perks that, uh, that were, uh, you know, given uh, for employee benefit. So I think, uh, you, you know, as founders, uh, this is this is a worthy area to hunt or to you know identify cost savings, uh, and then you'll see you'll see a lot of cost savings uh, embedded in the corporate corporate cost. And then finally, this is the point that Nidhi uh, Nidhi made: reversion to core. So this is a time to not be expansionary, and I you know I I try and uh, nuance it a little bit by saying that when I say expansionary expansionary initiatives, more often than not, are unprofitable or our businesses or business lines that you're incubating, which means that it warrants, it warrants initial investment. So I think this is the time, this is the point that you know, Nidhi was alluding to. This is the time to kind of retreat on all your expansionary initiatives, maybe even discontinue or at least hibernate business lines that are not very core, that are you know, fair weather business lines or some experiments that you may be doing. Now this is different from making an extra buck. Making an extra buck is maybe very opportunistic uh, revenue or you know, some business line that you are working on, which has suddenly become profitable. So basically the whole, uh, uh, the whole principle of, you know, making an extra buck is literally making an extra buck, meaning it has to be profitable. There's no point investing money in a new or incubating a new business line or revenue stream that is not, uh, not uh, value accretive, accretive to, to your overall cash. And then finally, I think uh, this is absolutely the ra last resor resort. And I mean it with a, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of empathy. Uh, and a lot of compassion. Uh, in some cases, founders don't have a choice and they're, you know, faced with this hard uh, choice of laying off people. And, uh, you know, I have founders confide into me that they have had restless nights and, uh, you know, it was a, it was a very, very emotional, emo emotionally challenging thing for founders to do because many of these were people, you know, who the founders themselves had hired. Uh, and so, and therefore this is absolutely the last resort. Uh, so before, you know, before laying off people, what we have seen some smart companies do, and this is more of a philosophical choice is that is saying that, you know, we're not going to lay off people, uh, whatever, uh, cost efficiencies we are looking to make on people, we'll take a flat pay cut. Let's say you are looking to, you know, save 20% cost on people. Everyone in the firm company takes a 20% pay cut. Founders in many cases are not taking salaries for the last two, three months. Now that is a very philosophical choice. And I think I personally subscribe to that, that as long as you can make that work. And of course you create slaps. So, you know, a guy who makes or a girl who makes two lakh or five lakh doesn't get, doesn't make a, doesn't uh, get a 20% cut, maybe gets a 5% cut. And the guy and the girl who's making 20 lakhs or 30 lakhs gets a 20% cut. So you create slaps based on, uh, based on existing salaries. Uh, so that is, I'd say the sec that's the second last resort. And then in some cases, you know, founders are stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea and you, have, you don't have a choice. And if you have to lay off people, just do it with a lot of dignity, do it with a lot of compassion. Because remember, people who are left behind, people who are, uh, who will continue with the company's journey are all watching. And these are the times that truly forge the culture and the ethos of a company. You know, the company's culture is built during during hard times. So it is very important to do this 
uh, you know, if you have to lay off people, uh, do it the right way. I think I can take questions before moving into the Yeah, a few questions. Uh, start with a couple of people related ones. Uh, Nishtha is asking if your company is one of the few growing in this pandemic and needs to hire to grow further, but you know this growth is likely to go back to normal after COVID, should you or should you not hire? I think uh, uh, if uh, if you are, now it depends again, these, these are uh, you know very situational questions. Now it depends if you are, you know, if you think this is a flash in the pan, if it is, this is just a two month momentum or a three month momentum, and then you won't be able to sustain the cost structures that you want to build today and you'll have to eventually lay off people in two months, I wouldn't advise that. Just, just principally, I wouldn't advise that because remember, this is absolutely the worst time to look for a job. For, for a person who has been laid off or an employee that has been laid off, this is absolutely, absolutely the worst time to look for a job. So I, I wouldn't do that now. It is opportunistic. And of course, you can make an extra buck for your company and increase value for your shareholder. But that is a pimiral, right? That is short-lived. Like in two months, if you're going to go back to your uh, you know COVID, uh, pre-COVID levels or whatever your uh, existing normal is, I wouldn't uh, I, I wouldn't uh, hire people unless there is a unless there is a way to hire people for a short term. I, if that's the case. By the way, the other interesting idea there is, a lot of companies are open open to loaning their employees to other companies that may have demand or that may have you know better uh, sort of demand dynamics right now. So you could instead of hiring people, you might you know reach out to a company that uh, either wants to lay off people or doesn't have you know uh, workforce operating at full efficiency and just loan loan people at at some at some cost. I think that may be a better better idea than uh, hiring someone now for opportunistic revenues and only to lay them off in two, three months time. Question from Karan. Uh, would it be appropriate to hire a CFO or finance head at this time to have financial prudence on a continuous basis or hire some consulting company like a virtual CFO for the same? I think it's, if you ask my personal opinion, I think it's appropriate to hire a CFO or a finance controller uh, anytime. Uh, you, know, you know, finance is a very, very important function and you want competent hands to be dealing with finance internally. Now, depending upon, you know, depending upon the situation, again, no one size fits all answer. I think a virtual CFO or a CFO on loan, CFO as a service is not, uh, CFO as a service is not necessarily a bad idea. Uh, so I think that's also a legit idea, but I think that's not a, that's not a long-term fix. Uh, so if you can afford it, I think it is prudent to hire, uh, uh, to hire a CFO at any point, any point in the, in, in the business uh, journey. Uh, one more question and we can move on is when the new normal is in a state of flux and the risk of activity in new business means you're burning resources, that's energy, momentum and capital. And you're also still uh, establishing revenue models. Um, are there scenarios where inactivity is the wise thing to do, especially when there's a physical risk of being exposed to COVID in, in the metros? That's a great question. That's a really good question. Uh, I think... Uh, yeah, and that's why this is one of the reasons, by the way, uh, this was, it was so hard to put together this deck, right? Because there is no one size fits, fits all solution. And, uh, and that's why, you know, I, I want to emphasize, emphasize more on the principles rather than the solution because what works for a company A may not necessarily work for company B. Uh, I think uh, in some cases, the wise thing to do is to just hibernate yourself and just survive, uh, you know, and just uh, hunker down and try and, you know, weather this crisis. And there are many categories, you know, uh, that uh, where the demand has been so severely hit, like 70, 80, 90 percent hit in demand, uh, that irrespective of what you do, unless you completely pivot your business model, which again, I think is a legit, legit idea if you can pull that off, if you, uh, you know, if you have some ideas that you think could work under current circumstances. And more importantly, there's a high degree of conviction on those ideas working out. If that's not the case, and you are in a business, you are in a market where, uh, you know, demand has uh, diminished 80, 90%, I would say just hibernate, like just lay low for two, three, four months till demand recovers. And then, you know, like we said, at the beginning of the beginning of the deck, the beginning of the session, you live to fight another day. So, so yeah, I think it's totally, totally legit and, uh, and a prudent, prudent thing to do. One final people question, and then we can take the rest later is how do we motivate employees during this time with salaries and appraisals on hold work from home is not getting easier, especially for women employees, any strategies and thoughts to keep people motivated. Yeah, again, a good question. I'd say, uh, you know, a few things we have seen work. Uh, one is, this is a great time 
to remind your employees of the mission that you are on and you know therefore the mission statement that uh, that uh, you know advisors and investors ask companies to chart out uh, is is for a reason and the reason is you know there is a direction there is a vision there is a mission all of us are in in it together uh, and uh, and we have to go you know we we have to keep charging ahead marching ahead towards that towards that mission so i think this is the and if if you are a founder that has built a culture that ha, you know where the vision and the mission of the company has really percolated down to the bottom i think it will be easier it will be much easier for you to reenergize your forces to rally your forces uh, versus in cases where it is very ambiguous or not fully understood uh, not fully bought in so i think this is a, if you have if you are a founder who have not who has not done that i think it's a great great time to remind your team of the mission that you have set out on uh because people like purpose people are and i'll give you a tangential example we we started this initiative called act i'm sure many of you would have read about it in twitter etc and other places and uh, you know it might sound sound like a easy thing to do because you know all you had to do was to raise money and distribute money or make grants to people but it was tough because you know we are working in a, in a team uh, where you know we you have to work together with uh, people that you compete with on a day to day basis right so these are you know rival firms competing firms uh and you know i had actually anticipated a very bumpy journey and there'll be a lot of you know disagreements and friction and i'm not kidding i'm not being you know i'm not making this up we had zero friction in the process we it felt like you know we have been always working in this team and this team you know comprises of people from excel and sequoia and lightspeed and matrix and it was just incredible what how uh, cohesively a uh, strong sense of purpose can bind people and unite people together so if your team is fully bought in bought in and has that you know burning sense of purpose i think it will be easier second thing uh, i'd say is uh, which is more tactical is transparency in communication i think this is a time and we have we have been doing this very well internally at sequoia like every two weeks we have a all hands meeting and i can tell you that we never had the all hands meetings at such high frequency every two weeks uh, you know all of us a 100 people or or so at at sequoia india and south asia we gather together we talk about you know issues we share news like the level of transparency uh, and in in communication um, that we have today is just incredible and i think it works because everyone feels a part of the process right people feel uh, people are looking for affiliation right people are looking for relevance and if you include them in this journey in this sort of fight against uh, against this menace that that covid is uh, i think people are more far more motivated in conscious of time so let's move ahead and then keep the rest of the questions towards yeah. the end so uh and you know last thing i think we've already touched upon this so i won't uh, harp too much on this but basically you know culture is forged in in bad times people are watching people around who are uh, who are still with the company are watching and do everything with integrity you you know in our minds in our hearts we always know what the right thing to do is and so just do the right things i, I is is probably something Uh, that i think uh, you know i i believe in and once you're out of this so the, the way i see it is this is uh, you know this is a crisis sure and we have to fight this crisis we have to wear this crisis but on the other side of the crisis the one the companies that survive will thrive because imagine what you'll have at the on the other side of the crisis you'll have a very lean team you'll have a very mission driven team your culture would have crystallized a lot more or would have seeped in a lot more in, into the organization your your organization will be super energized having defeated a menace like you know covid and uh, you'll have a very clear direction of uh, where the company is headed so you'll be agile you'll be fit, you know as a company you'll be fitter you'll be leaner you'll be meaner and then it allows you the ability to really you know charge uh, you know charge ahead uh, uh, you know with with lots of lots of momentum and what will also happen is that after covid i think there'll be a stronger momentum market momentum as well as the markets open up and economy starts recovering so there will be market momentum and you you have a you know merry market momentum with a team that is energized and and lean and uh, and you know purpose and mission driven and you know you you will have a you will have an opportunity to achieve uh, uh, things much faster and uh, it will just catalyze your journey i'm going to skip this this is a story of how alibaba uh, you know reacted in the wake of sars uh, so i'm going to skip this this is a very interesting story uh, there are many uh, you know articles on the web on this uh, on this story so feel free to go and uh, read the story uh, but this is a great example of how you know alibaba uh, 
uh, overcame the adversity that uh, SARS had imposed. And back then, imagine in 2003, there were no communication tools and work from home would have been incredibly hard. And yet they were able to launch Taobao.com actually before, before planned, before schedule, they were able to launch while the entire workforce was working from home. Uh, so I think uh, while, uh, you know, the way I see it is we are, we know we are entering a tunnel now. Uh, how long or short is that tunnel? Time is to tell. Uh, no one, I personally don't know how long this, uh, you know, pandemic and this economic crisis is going to last. Uh, so while, you know, we, all of us need to hunker down, make sure that we survive, make sure, uh, you know, that we're able to weather this uh, crisis and keep ourselves sane and, you know, keep ourselves healthy and, you know, keep our families healthy in this time. We should also not lose sight of the light at the end of the tunnel. And the light at the end of the tunnel is, uh, is this dream of uh, is this dream of uh, 2030? I think uh, 2030 is going is a landmark year for will be a landmark year for India's startup ecosystem. We will we'll have completed 20 years uh, since inception of the startup ecosystem, and I think uh, you know at least my belief is that at that time India will be a you know at least six to eight trillion economy, and India tech like startup ecosystem has an opportunity of creating a one one trillion uh, one trillion dollar, uh, you know, market cap. So I think, uh, and this is what you know personally gives me a lot of energy and gives me a lot of hope and gives me a lot of, uh, lot of uh, optimism amidst the you know clouds of uncertainty and and all the gloom and doom that we you know, that we become uh, used to, uh, you know, reading and 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 seeing in the press. Um, and I actually I'm very hopeful of all the uh, you know sunlight uh, that will shine. On our startup ecosystem, once the clouds of uh, COVID and clouds of this crisis has has lifted, so I am very very hopeful and optimistic about about our future, and I hope uh, uh, most of you would would be too. Great. I'm going to jump into a bunch of questions which have come in, including some that came to us in advance. Um, the first question is: Our company is going through a major pivot amidst COVID, COVID, and our new product has the potential to thrive amidst the new normal. How should we think about being opportunistic, which will shorten our runway by half? Uh, so that's a yeah, that's a tricky one. If there's a what I don't understand, we should maybe take this offline. Is how why does it shorten your runway? Now, and give you a framework, and I'm happy to you know happy to jam with you and brainstorm with you offline. I think if this is a revenue opportunity that is profitable, that is here and now, uh, and that uh, and you 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 think uh, uh, you know this is sort of sustainable at least in the short to medium term, you should totally totally jump on it. Uh, that being said, uh, it is uh, you also have, you you may also benefit from rethinking your existing model, your existing revenue. Like should you even continue if you have found a business model that really works or a revenue model that is more revenue potential that is more real, then should you even Continue with your existing model, but you know I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't give you a very dogmatic answer or like a very firm answer because I have no context on your business, so I'm happy to take this offline. But yeah, it is uh, the if your question is you know what is the north star metric here? It is cash in bank and it is runway. So I wouldn't do anything uh, at the expense of uh, at the expense of you know shortening my my runway. But I'm happy to take it offline. Okay, uh, next question is. Um... Sorry, just give me one sec. Um, I'm currently working on the pitch deck for my startup, which is an ideation stage. When you say, despite having competitors, uh, you can work towards strengthening the industry, isn't it likely to put investors off who might think that the company or brand is not ready to take on competitors or doesn't have a competitive mindset? Yeah. So see, competing, uh, so there are two types of competition, right? Healthy competition and unhealthy competition. Healthy competition is when your competitor makes you better. And I think uh, uh, it, it does. In many cases, you'll see competitors actually make you a better company because you, you can learn from the competitors. You can learn from your competitors. They also keep you on your toes so you never get complacent. Now, unhealthy competition is when you are out there to get each other. When you want to take each other down, you engage in brutal and you know debilitating uh, price wars, discounting wars, uh, you jack up salaries, you start poaching from each other, uh, you jack up salaries to an unsustainable point. Now that is unhealthy competition, competition, and that is totally dispensable. You don't need that. So when I say this is the time to collaborate with your uh, competitors, I mean, uh, you know, I'm referring to getting rid of all these uh, damaging 
comparative uh, strategies that uh, people that companies deploy all the time on each other so this is a time to go and you know extend olive branch to your competitor and say hey let's keep sanity on salaries let's keep sanity on discounting let's not discount it's not good for so do what's what's act- okay so the i think the kind of the north star here is do what's good for the collective good of the industry as long as that is uh you know what w- what you're doing i think that that could be kind of the overarching principle in dealing with your competitors now discounting is not good for the overall good uh artificially jacking up uh, you know salaries is again not overall good because it is it makes the industry uh, unsustainable great um a question related to an earlier slide when you were talking about ripping off the bandaid um consumers are forced to make a brand switch because certain products are not readily available in such a scenario how would ripping off the bandaid help the company stay relevant uh see i think uh, that's why i said uh, this uh, this is the time when uh, which kind of separates your good customers from your bad customers um now uh, actually, actually let, let me give an example there's there's a the same company that i referenced to when we when i was uh, making this point uh, f- for that company what we observed is their scale has gone down like i said 40% contribution margin scale has gone down to 40% contribution margin has gone up what does it tell you it tells you that a lot of the discounting and the marketing that the company was doing had negative roi was uh, actually not uh, not effective at all it was uh, uh, it was superfluous you shouldn't have done it in the first place so i think uh, again you know there is no right answer uh, that fits all but i i would say uh, that if you are a company and therefore you know there is some need there is some uh, uh, need for a ab testing type of a mentality here so you know don't run any discounts for for a week see what happens then maybe run at 20% of normal discounting or promotions and and see what happens on the customer front i think uh, you know while businesses are going through hardship customers are also going through hardship and all of us have experienced it being holed up in our houses having no access lines to anything right like bangalore of course is better but when i talk to my friends in bombay and delhi uh, the the supply lines are totally choked there so customers actually and even customers of kind of you know uh, can, have been pushed to the wall and in those situations customer discover yourself uh, i have heard so many stories of people uh, you know people uh, adopting grocery delivery my own parents they never used uh, grofers or big basket now they are they start to use it uh, i have seen i have heard of so many stories of you know people latching on to the digital uh payments uh, or this upi bandwagon they never needed to do it but now they need to do it which which means that the onus on marketing goes down because there is organic reason for customers to to find you uh a few people have asked uh, about your thoughts on raising venture debt to extend the runway uh i think uh, uh i mean if you can uh, if you can get cash cash is welcome whether it is you know venture debt whether it is equity i would not try and optimize for things like valuation things like terms if you are if you have less than 3 years of runway i just you know load up uh, as much cash as i can now of course that doesn't mean that you know you do it at uh, very draconian terms and like there is 5x lip pref and you know there is 80% deflation in price over the last time i mean and no sane investor and no i uh, investor would uh, go head in that direction but i'd say you know this is not the time to optimize for valuation this is not the time for op- for optimizing for the op- optics of fundraising just you know take the money that is available to you right now and uh, and uh, extend your runway to the extent possible um question again from nidhi if your company has a dip in revenue how will this be looked upon by investors um uh, assuming it's going to take about 6 months to bounce back the background being this is uh, a company operating in the essential sector and all major costs are corporate related uh see i think uh, you know investors are not living in a la la land right they're all investors are all living in the same in the same world and uh, there is a recognition of the fact that uh, a lot of this was unanticipated uh, this is a black swan event many companies uh you know have uh, uh, have seen revenues decline many industries have shrunk overnight and uh, this is an you know this is the nature of the beast today so i think uh, uh i think the investors get it and uh, especially for essentials i think the key question is structurally what does covid do to the industry in the long term does it benefit you 
does it harm you does it make the sector more relevant to a customer does it make it less relevant i think that's the bigger question in people's mind rather than the point in time metrics of growth point in time metrics of revenue uh, point in time uh, you know other sort of uh, point in time metrics so i think i i look at companies i personally would look at companies through the lens of uh, uh, the structural uh, issues stru- structural aspects of of the company rather than the point in time metrics that being said what uh, i think what all of us have to be prepared for is a softening in prices valuation multiples will definitely shrink because it is all a function of future or forward uh, expectation on revenue scale and of course that story has been dented to some extent so i think uh, uh, multiples will see a compression and that's why you know i said just take the money like if you are uh, getting money at some uh, reasonable terms i think I, i would take that without optimizing too much for price um okay imran is saying that you said discounting is not good for the ecosystem as a whole however jio brought a revolution by offering everything for free for some time although it affected their competitors it raised standards for consumers and brought more innovation so is discounting a viable option if it causes good disruption uh imagine if uh, you know if uh, airtel or any other telco had the same uh, deep pockets as as jio and uh, uh and you know there had been a and the discounting war would have prolonged for another 3 4 years so i agree with you i mean discounting a fundamentally like discounting is a economic instrument at the end of the day right and what does this economic instrument do the economic instrument uh increases adoption so people who would not have tried who have been would have been skeptical conservative in using or adopting a product now because of discounting you know they get a bit more comfortable and they uh, and it kind of lures them into the product and service but it's a fine line like you can't go you can't perpetually go on a discounting war or a discounting spree it has to stop at some point uh, and i think today is uh, today is not uh, you know today is not the time to engage in any discounting war because demand itself has subsided quite a bit in many sectors if anything like if you are and again without knowing the details of your if you are of your business and what you do if anything i'd say the dollar invested in brand building goes will go much longer than the same dollar going into discounting because brand building you know creates that perception in amplifies your brand salience and is a long term investment i see brand building as as a investment and you know discounting as a, as as a cost a non covid question um what are the common major differentiators you see in the saas space for india based companies selling in developed geographies versus us based companies apart from pricing yeah so i think uh, uh, i think i i at least personally believe that india engineering talent and quality in india is second to none uh, and of course there are some pockets like ai ml where we still have a long way to go and maybe china and us are more competitive but broadly i think as far as application uh, engineering is concerned i think india is second to none uh, we are we have a very very deep and very high quality pool of talent so i think uh, now product management talent is a, has has still some way to go before we start matching uh uh or you know seeing shoulder to shoulder to the us companies uh but i think uh, product will be got differentiation for india because i mean uh, engineer in the valley will cost like 2 3x at least sorry at least in then uh, the engineer engineer in in bangalore if you go to a smaller city even more that uh, that delta increases even more now imagine with that such a uh, significant cost advantage what Uh, we can do as founders and as a, as a saas ecosystem to product evolution can we accelerate our product evolution can we make our products more feature rich uh, can we offer you know better service better customer uh, success uh, uh, you know to to our clients of course we can because we have the we have the cost advantage so i think product while it is not apparent today product will become one of the big differentiators for india uh in a you know in in the next few years in fact we are already seeing some some sign early signs of it because for a client you know product is not say you are a ceo you are writing a million dollar check right now for you the product is not just the you know application that uh, that you are that your employees fire up every day right for you the product is the application plus the service the customer service and the customer success support uh that that the that the company can offer so i think for a, from a cio standpoint they see product as a combination of uh, the application and the service and support and i think india uh, has a structural advantage when it comes to service and support and in many of us as companies when we call up customers 
I think uh, one of the benefits uh, or advantages that uh, customers oftentimes cite, uh, uh, you know, in favor of Indian, Indian SaaS companies is the quality of service and support. I think we're out of time. So we just take two more questions and then wrap. Um, one is from Sanket who's saying post COVID due to mass unemployment or lack of liquidity or purchasing power. How do you see this affecting uh, startup revenues in, in the coming time? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, I'd say, see, there are two levers, right? One is uh, actually, if you think about it, uh, there are three levers. The, the fundamentally there are three levers to the growth of a, uh, product or, or the startup ecosystem in general. One is the entire spend or consumption bucket. So how much as India, how much do we consume? We consume $1 trillion worth of goods and services. Uh, the second is, uh, uh, second is penetration. So out of say 1 billion people in India, how many people really consume digital goods and services? Say that number is 100 million today for the sake of simplicity. And the third is the share of wallet that digital goods and services have within these 100 million households or 100 million customers that are availing digital goods and services. Now, what you're saying, Sanket, you know, dents the story in short term for on the first lever, which is the overall consumption. So overall consumption in India, 1 trillion grows 6%, 5, 6% in that, in that zone. Maybe this year it shrinks by 5%, right? Or maybe it grows only 2%. So sure, I mean, one part, one lever is uh, kind of uh, diminished. But think about the other two levers. Has COVID catalyzed digital adoption in India? The answer is... Uh, you know, unequivocal, yes, it has. Uh, you know, we've all heard examples of, uh, you know, EdTech growing 2x in terms of adoption, grossly growing 3x. Uh, so I think, and, and that trend will only continue. Right? So the, the, I think the universe of digital buyers in India has expanded, so definitely expanded, like definitely expanded due to COVID. Then the, the third lever is the share of wallet of digital services. So out of $100 that you spend, how much do you buy from Flipkart and Amazon? Right? That's the question. I think that number is also expanded thanks uh, to COVID because now people don't have a choice. They don't want to expose themselves to the virus risk by going to retail stores, offline, offline purchases, and online is you know seems safer. So I'd say while the first lever has been dented, I would take if this is a contrarian view, I would take the contrarian view that uh, you know after COVID, once the supply lines have been debottlenecked and there's been uh, you know easing off of restrictions there i think the the covid will actually you know in hindsight we'll we'll all see that covid has actually catalyzed the evolution of uh, of uh, the digital ecosystem in india so what were, what would have otherwise happened in 18 months i think will happen maybe in 18 weeks or or a shorter period of time Okay, um, I think one last question. There are lots coming in. Apologies, we can't get to everything. Uh, we close with this. Um, Vikram is asking, what advice would you give to founders whose startup is in ideation stage so that they can build resilient and sustainable businesses irrespective of the pandemic or any other uncertainty? Yeah, it's a good question. I think uh, you know it might seem like a, a very adverse time to, to be starting up uh, and... Uh, and on ground, yes, I mean, it is tough because there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, the pandemic is rife and, you know, supply lines are choked and so on and so forth. But if you look at history, and again, you know, I started the, the presentation by saying that the good news is that this pandemic may be new, but the economic devastation or the economic crisis that we're facing today is not new. We've seen this cycle many a times. And if you, uh, if you were to take a leaf out of the, uh, the GFC book, uh, the Global Financial Crisis of 2008, 2009, you'll see that many of the companies uh, that uh, today stand very tall were actually founded right in the wake of uh, the GFC. And, uh, and there's a reason for it. The fundamental reason for that is any crisis creates, a, kind of spawns many behavioral change. So organizations change behavior. Today, all of us are talking about work from home. Uh, it changes individual behavior. Uh, you know, we may not go to offline store forever. Uh, or there's a, you know, there's increasing need for mindfulness and mental wellness type of products, and which was probably less pronounced, say th three, four months ago. And you know, societal behavioral change, government behavioral change. So it spawns a bunch of behavioral change. And you know, all of us have, all of us here know and appreciate that the best businesses are born at the cusp of a big behavior change. Whether it was, you know, Airbnb, Uber that started, or Ola, uh, Closer Home, Zomato, uh, that started you know, at the cusp of this sort of gig economy taking off and shared uh, assets, uh, uh, you know, being, uh, uh, being, uh, being a reality. So I think uh, 
this is a great time to start up because there will be a lot of behavior change that will happen and if you can align yourself with a behavior change that over time mutates into a big uh, sort of trend uh, i think uh, you are you are in for gold uh, because you know not too many people would be doing that or thinking about that that right now so i'd say it's a, it's a good time and uh, what you have to do is to you know fundamentally think about a profitable business model i think uh, uh, you know you have to think about making money sooner than later and just surviving somehow surviving the next uh, next couple of years when uh, and hopefully you know good times will be back uh, back very soon